Shakti uh, from Indiana University. And fun fact, she was just telling us how that was about information diffusion and social networks. And she's since made the switch to deep RL, uh, worked a lot in robotics, a few interesting demos that she'll talk to us about. And yeah, uh, and she's just now taken on new things. So new adventures, hope, hope to hear more from you. Take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for uh, inviting me here. But you guys can see the slides, right? Um, cool. Um, yeah, my background is pretty interesting. I feel uh, one thing I've learned pretty well from my PhD is how to do research in a new area. <laughs> so I keep on working on very different topics, uh, but I have enjoyed this journey so far. Um, and today I'm going to talk about some work um, I did at robotic, robotics team at OpenAI. Um, um, let's see. Okay. Um, so one big picture problem at our robotics team is to develop an algorithm that can power pretty uh, general purpose to robots. So if you uh, think about a general purpose robot in a very complex environment. It should be able to handle, like effectively and efficiently handle different objects in the environment, um, carry most of the tasks that humans can do. This would demand the robot to be able to adapt to the environment. <clears throat> and, oops, sorry. And today, um, Motivated by this, we did um, two like big robotics projects in, in the past like two and three years. Um, and today um, I'm gonna give you a, a quick introduction to both of them. And in both cases, um, I would say meta-learning plays a pretty important factor to help a single policy achieving amazing generability environments, either in we train the policy in SIM, um, it generalized to real world, or we train the policy on, um, on certain task distribution, and later the policy can transfer to tasks that it, if never seen or uh, trained on during the training time. Um, I, I do believe in both cases, um, it, it showcases uh, the possibility of building general purpose robots based on such a nice generalizability, uh, generalizability of the policy. So in, in the first uh, projects, you might know this already, uh, we train a robot hand control policy, 100% in simulation, and we deploy that on the real world robots, try to solve a fully scrambled Ruby skew. And in the second projects, um, we mainly try to push the edge of um, training a very generic policy that can solve all kinds of object uh, rearrange tasks on tabletop, like giving any objects, it should be able to rearrange to any uh, configuration um, that you desire. Um, so in our case, um, at test time, our policy can generalize to many unseen tasks like planning a table, uh, stacking blocks, or solving simple puzzles. Okay. Um, um, so in the in the Ruby School projects, uh, we are interested in learning dexterity, you know, like robot hands, because to some extent, our hands are, are like universal and effectors. And a lot of objects in the world are building around how we can interact with objects uh, using our hands. So if we can control human like robot hands well, we could potentially automate many tasks currently done by human. It is a quite hard task due to, for example, um, the high, dimension, uh, high dimensionality in the control space. In our case, we have 24, um, 24 degree of freedom and 20 actuator in the 
shadow hands. In the observations of always noisy, also it's very hard to accurately simulate this um, hand in the simulation. Um, we, uh, unsurprisingly, we adopt reinforcement learning to learn a policy to control the hand. As we know, reinforcement learning is pretty powerful, but it's also data, very eager for a lot of data. And collecting data on the physical hand sounds, <laughs> sounds hard because the, the robots are fragile. So it takes a lot of time to actually collect that amount of data. So we decide to go with the same to real approach. That is, we train everything in simulation and then deploy that on the real robot. However, um, same to real approach might fail drastically because as I said earlier, it's impossible to perfectly model such a complicated robotic system. Um, as a result, policy trained in simulation might just fail in the real world. Actually, it, it did happen at the beginning of our projects, uh, like nothing we're seeing on the real world box, um, likely due to unmodeled differences between real or sim. Um, like they might overfit to the simulation environment, but no, nothing about the physical world. Uh, it's a little uh, videos of the hand um, trying to solve the cube. Like eventually we made it work. Um, and this video is, it's not speed up. So it's normal, that's normal pace. One interesting observation uh, we had during many physical deployment is the first few actions usually are slower and more unstable. But as the policy was like starting to adapt to this real world environment, it gets like faster and smoother. Uh, if you if it passed five to ten rotations and flip, um, it usually can achieve uh, finish the whole. Uh, solution, solving solution um, successfully. But if it fails, it often happens at the beginning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that and how that's connected with meta learning later. I had a little quick question, just if that's OK. Sure. So in sure. The, in, you said in the early days it failed. And then mm -hmm. that was because of maybe modeling inaccuracies. So could you tell us a little bit more about like what you got wrong like my understanding is that the contacts are super hard to model was mm -hmm. that the case was it those kind of interactions between the object and the hand that were mm -hmm. causing it to fail or something else mm -hmm. uh it's uh i totally agree contacts is very hard to simulate and we didn't we, we didn't invest much on making the simulation more realistic, rather we use domain randomization to make the training environments very broad. And I'm gonna talk about that right after. Like for context, we just use the normal routing settings in Majoko without much like improvement, honestly. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, Wait. Oh, oh um, the big picture or the bold message we can get from this project is we have a distribution of training environments. Um, we use domain randomization to create a really broad and diverse training uh, environment and train a policy with memory. Um, and after enough trainings and um, we believe we're seeing emerged model learning effects. And because of this adaptability, uh, the model, the policy can solve real world tasks, although it's never seen the real world tasks or the real world settings during training before. Uh, this, diverse, um, this diverse training distribution um, is generated by the technique called domain randomization. Um, it's a quite simple idea, I would say. Um, with domain randomization, a, a variety of attributes of both the vision and physical uh, parameters in your simulator are randomized. Like at the beginning, you can, like before the training, you set 
a certain range for each physical or vision attribute. And during training time, you can sample environments by like randomly sample values for each attribute. And then even you essentially create many different copies of your simulation environment. And the goal of the policy is to solve the task in all of this environment. That's make the policy pretty uh, good at adapting to changing environments. Um, so um, we, uh, in our first release, uh, we showcase using Shadowhand to rotate block. For that project, we use the typical um, domain randomization, meaning we preset the range for each attribute before the training starts. Um, that requires a lot of uh, iterative tuning of what is the best range, because if it is too large, um, the, the model just cannot learn. <laughs> The task is just too hard, but if it's too small, the mass quick the policy can learn that it doesn't transfer to the physical robot. So we did a lot of tuning to make the range actually just perfect. Um, but um, when we got to the stage we want to solve Ruby's queue, this iteration process it just wouldn't work. Um, that's how we decide to do automated domain randomization. Um, for, um, okay, I will, I will start with this. So for automated domain randomization, we start with a very small distribution of training environments. We um, like, for example, every parameters, every attributes in the simulation start with a fixed value, a very small range of the value. And during training, we sample um, the sample environment from this distribution and do rollouts. And then the model parameter will be updated with this rollout data. Uh, okay. And then we evaluate how good the, the current policy performs in the current distribution of environments. And we get a score. The score will be report back to some performance manager note and tracking the score. When the score is big enough, we will extend this distribution. Otherwise, we will shrink. Mm -hmm. And this whole process, uh, I repeated during, um, like during the entire time of the training. As you're making the policy better and better, we extending the distribution, make it harder and harder. So this this essentially at its core, uh, automated domain randomization or ADR implements a training curriculum that gradually expands the distribution over an environment. And to put them together, um, domain randomization is fixed, but ADR has the potential to expand to cover a much broader distri uh, environment distribution, the real world may or may not be somewhere in this plot. We actually don't know because uh, we couldn't measure all the attributes precisely on the physical machine, uh, but we mainly rely on the generalizability of the policy to handle the real world case. So this is a simple plot to showcase how we increase uh, the randomization range of one parameters. Um, this is for uh, cube size. So at the beginning, it started with the real Ruby's cube size. Uh, as the policy start to be really good at solving this task, we increase the size. So eventually, the policy will be able to solve the case with tiny, tiny Ruby's cube, but also the big ones. Um, we uh, we implement ADR in a fairly simple set. We, we just assume everything is independent and control the range for each parameters uh, independently. Uh, um, so ADR, because ADR is essentially implementing a curriculum um, that is adaptively increasing the distribution of training environments that is just right for the policy, not too hard, um, not too easy. 
Uh, we believe this curriculum of effects is pretty important. Um, in this set of experiments, we train one policy with ADR um, and compare that against with multiple policy trained with fixed randomization. And the ADR version, uh, the blue one, achieves higher same to same transfer much faster than our other rounds. So other rounds will start with uh, very small uh, randomization or bigger randomization. They eventually achieve uh, like worse performance and their, the, the whole training is also slower. Uh, we did, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we believe meta learning is a very important factor. We did a couple of experiments to showcase the science of meta learning. Uh, in this case, we ran uh, 10,000 10, 10, simulated trials with only cube flip until 50 flips got achieved. So on the X axis, it tracks um, within one trial. Um, for the first flip, second flip, uh, third flips, how much time um, does it take to finish that flip? So the y-axis is the time to complete. Uh, the baseline is uh, around without any interactions. Um, so interestingly, at the first or second flip takes more time. Um, but once it gets to know the environments, like you populate the memory in the policy during the first few interactions, the time decreased and like flat. Um, for the interrupted run, the blue curve, we erase the LCMI hidden state at flip the 10th flips and 30th flips. Uh, you will see the time to complete the flip jumped up right after that. In the policy have to re learn to readapt to the environment again, and then the time decrease. Um, it's while pretty much aligned with what we observed during physical deployment, actually. And it's, um, it indicates that the policy does um, relies on learning about environments and like saving that information in the hidden state in order to uh, complete the task more efficiently. Uh, so then we try uh, another Lily, type there's of- a, There's mm -hmm. a question on chat. Yeah. Uh, David, do you want to go ahead and ask it? Uh, sure, you, maybe could, you can finish your thought here because this is related to a different slide, so. Oh, um, how about I finish this uh, meta learning experiment? Okay. Yeah, this is um, this is a not another type of perturbation, pretty much similar to uh, the the last one. But instead of erasing the LCM memory, we reset the dynamics uh, uh, in the environment. Like maybe we change the friction, uh, we change the KP of the uh, the robot hands, um, but we keep the heat and stay on change. So in this case, we see very similar phenomenon that you see a spike on um, time to complete a flip right after that. And then the policy adapt to the new environment again and the time decrease. So, um, 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 to further like to further showcase that he and state does have information about the environment. We also try to predict environment parameters such as a cube size using the policy's memory, because we believe uh, the capability of the policy to infer and store useful information uh, is um, correlated with the diversity of the training environment. So we, uh, we actually take policies that are trained with different, uh, different sizes of the task distribution and see how well each of them can predict the cube size and we see a, a nice positive correlation um, indicating that larger ADR entropy corresponds to more diverse training environment distribution and give, which can give us better, uh, just better prediction accuracy about the environment. Um, okay, um, 
I think I can take the question. Okay, yeah. So this was just about when you were first starting to talk about the automated domain randomization. Uh, first, I guess, mm -hmm. just to make sure it isn't a learned thing, right? Like it's just a mm -hmm. set policy? To... Uh, so ADRs only control the the randomization range for each parameters in your simulation. And the learning, uh, it is learned during training and it's quite simple. Uh, like maybe you start with one value, say um, you start one, one value with a cube size. You set the cube size with the actual Rubik's cube size. And then during the training, um, you will see the policy getting really good at solving a task for this cube size. And when the performance is good enough, you get to a point saying, oh, I mean, it's not challenging for the policy. There's no new skills for the policy to learn. You will increase the range of the cube size, uh, for example, from 5.5 .5 to 5.9. Then, during the training, like your rollout worker will sample environments with cube size that can fall into this range. You will sample between 5.5 .5 to 5.9, and your policy should, uh, your policies expect to learn all the tasks that can handle uh, any cube size fall into this range. So that is a harder task compared to a pizza size cube. Uh, cube. Then um, during training, you will see the performance drops. So you'll wait until the policy performance get up and learn this variations in different cube size, learn how to handle small ones, how to handle big ones. In the increase, uh, the performance increase again, you will know, okay, it's not challenging enough again. And I will expand this um, cube size range. So this process can go on basically forever uh, if you have a pretty large policy. Yeah, so I, I saw some recent work which uh, did like basically had an adversarial agent which generated the environments, uh, AKA mm -hmm. like the, the domain randomization was essentially controlled by a learned agent. Uh, was that something you guys mm -hmm. all tried during the uh, experiments? Mm -hmm. um, in, in another work we did, uh, I, I will talk about that right after this on symmetric software. It's a bit like that, but we use another agent to set the goal, to, to provide, to produce the actual task for the base policy to solve. Um, in this, in ADR, um, we did try to use uh, like, like GM um, or other type of model uh, or energy-based uh, model to learn the parameter distribution. But it, it ends up like it's more complicated and we don't see much improvements on performance. So we, we stay with this simple factorized ADR eventually. Um, yeah. Maybe for, yeah, maybe for better tuning, uh, energy-based. Modeling will work. Um, okay. um, yeah, this question. is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, uh, just curious, did you guys find that there are some parameters which matter more than other parameters? So, like, for example, I know that from my experience with solving Rubik's cubes, if the Rubik's cube is mm -hmm. like very, very well lubricated or very, very like hard to move around, that mm -hmm. screws up my solve time. So, in terms of like gravity, Rubik's cube size friction in general, were there stuff that mattered more than other things or was everything roughly as important to making the policy perform better? Um, it, they're totally, they're totally different. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, like, um, for example, like wind, we have a parameter control how hard a wind is. Um, it won't, it will have, a much smaller effect on changing the uh, gravity's direction. Okay, I see. Um, like event, we can track how fast the randomization range per parameter is changing during the training. 
if it can quickly expand to the full range, mm. it indicates that it's a less important right. uh, parameter. But if it stay like with a very narrow range, um, usually it suggests it's quite Got important. It. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this is a, um, a, like a, a small <laughs> showcase that how robust our policy is at a physical deploying time. We, we try to sabotage the uh, Rufus Q solving process. For example, we, we put a rubber glove. Um, it's hard to say, but like in the second, in the middle one on the first row, we put a rubber glove on the hand, um, <clears throat> which totally changed the friction. Um, or we tie certain fingers together um, or poking uh, the, the cube during the process. We found that the system is quite surprisingly robust to all this perturbation and the performance is not as its peak, um, but it's doing decently well. Um, and I do, I do think um, ADR played an important role in this process. Although, because um, when you're poking or when you're sabotaging this process, a lot of parameters are changing for a brief moment and the policy still can adapt to that. Um, because they have been exposed to a very diverse training distribution. Okay, um, so this is another uh, a more recent project. Uh, we are motivated to train a single goal condition policy that can solve any, the goal is to solve any robotic manipulation task in a given environment. Um, to, um, we, um, we study this manipulation environment with a tabletop setting. So we have a table, uh, and one, a single your arm is mounted at the back with a gripper at the end. And in this environment, the task is defined by an uh, initial state of objects. As you can see, there are a couple items of different colors on the table. And the, uh, oh yeah, this is a better one. And the goal state is um, a, a certain, uh, configuration of the objects. So we provide both the position and orientation of each piece. Then the robot has to rearrange all those pieces into the desired um, desired shape. The problem might seem simple at its formulation, but um, we believe it can challenge a wide variety of cognitive ability of the robot. Like it has to understand um, concave shape, um, how to put them together in certain orders, um, that would be quite challenging. And follow the ideas in Ruby's Cube projects. Uh, our approach is to, we train a single policy on a very large and diverse training distribution. Then we evaluate our progress by testing the training distribution on many on-scene holdouts. Like we explicitly not including those holdout tasks in training. And which make it possible for us to evaluate the zero shot generalizability of the policy. And in order to solve all those unseen holdouts, the, po the policy has to, um, needs to do meta learning at test time. One open question in this approach is how we can build a training distribution that is rich enough. Um, it can be, um, as I said, uh, we need to define initial state distribution. Uh, we use, we just randomly sample everything um, here. But what is this goal distribution? Um, our, sorry. Uh, oh, uh, by the way, for our objects, uh, we used, uh, in our biggest environment, we just use uh, shape nets objects as like, 40 to uh, 40,000 to 50,000 objects. We just randomly sample them and randomize the size, put them right on the table. That would be the initial state. For goal state, um, we, we adopt this training framework called asymmetric, asymmetric self play. Uh, it was originally proposed by Sukabara in 2017. The original work only used a small fraction of self-play episodes as a way to provide additional learning signals. 
when when they still train the policy on the target task, like maybe blending 5%, 10% of self-play episodes, they help you learn the task faster. Um, but uh, differently in our case, we don't train the policy on any of the ta uh, target tasks. Instead, we train a policy 100% with asymmetric self-play. Um, and the holdouts are just used for tests. Uh, okay, let's see how it works. Um, we, uh, we, in our uh, asymmetric self training framework, we have two policy. The first one we call that Alice. Uh, Alice is a goal generation policy for a given initial state of the environment. Alice would generate a, a goal by interacting with object. Um, at, then at the end of Alex episode, we take that the end configuration as a goal and we reset the simulation to the same initial state. Uh, Bob is the goal condition policy. So Bob knows uh, what the target is that is just proposed by Alice and try to um, manipulate the objects to achieve the same state. In our asymmetric self play, we we'll jointly train Alice and Bob using DBRL. That's not surprisingly. Okay, and more precisely, um, this is how our like rollout worker works. At the beginning of the episode, we first sample an initial state from the distribution, like shape my objects, random position orientation. We, then we generate a trajectory of a fixed number of steps in which Alice interacts with objects to change their configuration. At the end, we will set the last state as a goal for Bob. And Bob is a goal condition policy. And Bob attempts to solve this goal. Um, in, this, in this process, um, Bob obtains a goal condition reverse. Like for example, if uh, one goal, uh, one object, we, we provide a sparse, uh, sparse goal condition reward, meaning an object has to match exactly the position orientation uh, or in the goal state in order for Bob to obtain reward one. If it's just getting closer, um, there's no reward. Um, okay. Once Bob, at the end of Bob's turn, Alice would receive a positive reward if Bob fails. Otherwise, no reward for Alice. So Alice is, is motivated to propose goals that are increasingly challenging to Bob, where Bob is forced to solve increasingly complex goal. In, in this process, we repeat this process for five goals uh, in one episode. So it's a multi-goal episode. I think there's a quick question in the chat. Yeah. I guess it's sure. what's the reason for a sparse reward over a dense reward for Bob? Like, why would you prefer a sparse reward? Uh, that's like preparing for, I would say dense reward might be easier to train, but if you want to deploy it on physical robots, we may need a vision based classifier to tell you whether a goal is achieved. And sparse reward is much easier to model in that case. There's a couple okay. of other questions in chat as well, but mm -hmm. yeah, uh, like I see a question from Chris. What's the benefit of having Alice be a fixed step manipulation policy versus just predicting the final pose or orientations of the objects? Um, meaning like uh, having Alice only predicting the goal rather than interacting with the environment? Is that the question? I think so. Um, and this slide's gonna tell you about that. It's quite, it's actually quite important to actually roll out Alice rather than just predict the final state because uh, some, of, some of the goal are very challenging. But for whatever goal proposed by Alice, we, we have one solution. We know there's the solution that is Alex trajectory to provide additional learning signal to train Bob. Uh, we use Alex's trajectory as demonstration for behavior cloning. 
um, in our experiment, if we don't provide this behavior cloning signal, it's very hard for Bob to learn. Um, we call this Alice behavior cloning, uh, so ABC. It's a very neat name. Um, so to do so, we first copy Alex's trajectory um, that is known. If Bob fails to achieve a goal, then we just relabel this uh, trajectory to be a goal conditioned, uh, goal conditioned version and add an additional term on um, behavior cloning uh, loss and add it together with a normal RL loss. Um, Go on. And there are a couple of smart tricks we did to stabilize um, ABC. Uh, because Alex's trajectory might be suboptimal, you can imagine Alex just moving items back and forth like at random. Um, so uh, we, um, in the first, so we don't want to adopt behavior cloning for every trajectory from Alice. Instead, uh, we filter demonstration only when Bob fails. That's quite important. Another one we did is uh, to prevent drastic policy change, we adopt something similar to uh, PPO to clip uh, the difference between old and new policy. Um, this is how uh, a smaller-ish effect on stabilization. Um, I'm going to introduce two sets of environment we did. Uh, the first one is simple one. It's more like to proof concept and showcase certain behaviors. Uh, the first experiment, um, we just take one blocks or two blocks, put them in, in <laughs> of the same size, uh, put them in environment. And we consider four holdout tasks to corresponding to four different manipulation skills. They're pushing the item, um, flip, flip the block, uh, picking up a block up in the air, and stacking two blocks together. Those four skills are um, just for testing, as I said. Oh, uh, the transparent one are goals. Okay. Um, if we just take this four um, task together, um, maybe sample 25% of time for each goal and train directly with PBO, the policy cannot learn anything. <laughs> it's just a very hard task. Uh, we have some um, imperfect baseline, like we manually maybe increase the distance between goal and objects and try to create some manual curriculum and didn't get good luck with it as well. Um, but with asymmetric self-play, um, we were able to generalize to all four ODAO tasks in zero shot. It suggests that asymmetric self-play can reduce the importance of the manually designed curriculum. So this is, uh, we also found that um, our self-play setup often discover unexpected goals and solutions that are not explicitly validated. For example, this one, we have four blocks and the app. <laughs> okay, this is quite interesting to watch. Uh, the arm learns to stack all four of them together and tilt it the tower by like, uh, with its arm. Um, quite nicely with ABC, Bob policy learns a proper solution to this very novel goal. Uh, we also conduct a ablation study for ABC. Uh, when ABC was completely disabled, Bob fell drastically um, and couldn't, just couldn't learn anything. Um, like, this is the case when on the uh, both both of the policy are trained with asymmetric self play. The left one has ABC turned off. The right one has ABC enabled. The left one completely fails. 
Uh, next, we disable demonstration filtering, meaning we collect demonstrations and analysis for all the goals. No matter Bob fails or achieves the goal, um, in this case, we observe a noticeable instability in the flipping task. Like the Bob start to forget something. Maybe it, it like a, it, it take the suboptimal trajectory from Alice. Um, for PBO cell click lobbing, and um, it shows slightly slower learning on pick and place. Also, some instability uh, in the middle of the training. Um, we also experiment in a more complex environment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we sample objects from ShapeNet. In this case, we sample a random one to 10. Um, objects and also randomize the size, put them on the table. We, because um, the shape of the object could be tricky to handle, uh, in this case, we do fit uh, the true state and vision into the policy, so both state and vision, that the observation space contains the current position rotation of the flop, uh, the block, sorry, it should be object. Target, posi target position and rotation of objects, images from the risk cameras and the top camera, um, and also the target, um, the target image. For shape nine environments, we create a rich set of holdout tasks, including many thematically interesting ones, such as um, setting a table or completing a 10 gram puzzle. Uh, I want to emphasize that all the objects in the holdout task are not part of the shape net objects. So we create those objects from um, other data set or just create them manually. Okay. Uh, the learned ball policy is able to achieve a quite decent uh, zero shot generalization performance. Here are two examples. As you can see, um, the goal is at the bottom. Um, the top one are the robot try to solve it. We have um, a lot more videos of how the robot is solving the task at roboticsselfplay.github.io, so you can check it out. Okay. This figure shows the generalization performance on the complete set of task, uh, test tasks. Overall, we observe pretty encouraging results on, um, on a large proportion of the holdout tasks. But we also noticed that several tasks are still very challenging. For example, um, this is for bowl capture. It requires decent handling of rolling objects because we have two like small bowls in it and lifting skills in order to put the balls between this small cylinder. Um, rainbow task, yes, rainbow tasks are hard because it requires an understanding of concave shapes, which are very rare in shape net. I actually don't remember, maybe I don't remember any objects or concave there. Um, stacking, Stacking more than three blocks is challenging. Um, I mean, I guess we all know stacking is a challenging task. Uh, we, we can achieve some success with three blocks, um, but no luck with four block stacking. Okay. To, to summarize, we found that Asymmetric self play can train a goal condition policy that can zero shot generalize to many unseen robotic manipulation tasks. We also find that asymmetric self play is able to alleviate the importance of many curriculum for learning very challenging tasks. And we found that behavior cloning from Alex trajectory is super crucial to make the whole process successful. At the end, uh, we open source this environment, both the RubyQ stuff and the tabletop setting, as well as a bunch of like evaluation uh, tasks um, 
called RoboGem. Uh, you can find it in OpenAI GitHub account. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Lillian. Yeah. That, that was a really wonderful talk. So yeah, for anyone in the audience, we have still a few minutes left for questions. So feel free to just unmute yourself and like ask any questions that you might have. And yes, so one thing I was wondering about when you're describing this asymmetric self play work was, have you uh, tried that on, you know, a few long horizon or compositional tasks? Like, uh, you know, the kind of skills you learn, can they be compositional in the sense that you learn to build one tower, can generalize the tasks that require building multiple towers? Um, mm, I would say long horizon task is still a challenging for us. Uh, in our setting, we didn't explicitly encode the ideas of um, composition. Um, how we handle the number of objects is really just a randomly sample number between one and 10, and then sample that many of objects. Um, and like, like in this plot, um, stacking four blocks, it's still an impossible task in our setting. So I do think that's something we need to improve. Thanks. Yeah. I have a question. Thank you for the great talk. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if mm -hmm. you have looked at scaling laws for deep reinforcement learning, because you're looking at these big scale training settings. And I was curious, very interested by the neural language scaling laws. So I was wondering if mm -hmm. you've explored similar laws and if parameter size has a similar effect in the setting. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Um, um, back then, uh, when we're doing this project, I don't, we didn't particularly look into that. Um, it's a, it'll be a quite expensive experiment to <laughs> uh, I do remember um, some people with an open eye are looking at scaling law for deep RL in general. Um, yeah, but um, that's yeah, not on top of my mind right now. Um, sorry. Yeah, thank you. That would be interesting thing to look at. I mean, I think even from my experience, like parameter size doesn't really have the same effect for reinforcement learning. This doesn't seem to be the main issue, but maybe uh, curious if you have any experience with that. Yeah. Uh, the size of the policy does matter, I will say. Um, maybe there is a critical point that once it's large enough, they will be able to solve it. Like just for the tabletop manipulation task, um, if we um, if we cut the uh, size of the model by half, uh, it wouldn't be able to handle all this um, task, uh, all this holdout tasks. But we didn't look into how precisely, like what's a critical point uh, or what is the minimum policy size we need for certain tasks? So that's an open question. So one related question to your first uh, part of the talk is like in sim to real, there seems to be two schools of thought. Like one is you build as accurate a simulator as possible but like, you know, do some form of domain randomization on the simulator so that you get much closer to having a policy that'll work without any transfer. But there's also the other spectrum of like learning a policy that works in sim uh, one particular instance of a simulator, but then trying to do some form of adaptation of that policy to the real world. Like, have you also explored, you know, that line of thought for the Rubik's Cube or was mainly focused on domain randomization. Mm. Um, at the early stage of the projects, we did try something like that. Like we first 
take the policy and train that in FIM with some amount of randomization. And during the deploying time, we try to fine tune the policy with real world data at test time. Um, it's, it was pretty hard <laughs> um, because um, uh, collecting, like, first of all, your, your policy has to run for some number of actions successfully in order to give you the raw data. And second, it's very slow to collect this the raw data, but fine tune your RL policy requires a lot of data. So we end up, and we use PPO. Um, so I end up um, often just completely break the policy behavior and doing weird stuff. We didn't invest more beyond that. Um, iterating in simulation with domain randomization gave us good results and it's very fast um, to iterate. Um, I see, yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, I also know that you have a hard stop at uh, one. So like if there are no more pressing questions from the audience, uh, we could thank the speaker again. Like, uh, thanks so much. Like uh, it is really exciting to hear you talk. And also, you know, thanks for taking the time to talk to us before uh, the actual talk and like trying to tell us about all the new cool things you're trying to do. So yeah, we'll keep an eye out on all the work that comes out in your new role. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you for having me Thanks here. for doing this. Thank mm -hmm. you. Super cool talk. Thank you guys. Thanks. Have a nice day.